Well, good day, my friends. Your old pal, Jordan the Lion, and I am back at you with another uh, tale of my celebrity encounter stories. Now, I've been doing a handful of these, and I always feel like I've run out of stories, even though I've met a lot of people. I just feel like I got to meet them in a weird situation, but there's no real story to any of it. And then, you know, I'll be talking to my girlfriend, telling her some, you know, person that I met, how I met them, and in the process of looking for that photo, I'll see all kinds of others that actually spark memories. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna go over some of the ones I didn't think were that great of stories, but in hindsight, they are kind of cool. So, Days with Jordan the Lion, you all, and more celebrity stories begins now. All right, everyone, let's start out with probably the most famous woman in the world right now, Taylor Swift. I accidentally, <laughs> or luckily, uh, when I was acting, got cast for her My Wildest Dreams music video. And I, I didn't know it at the time. It was a background gig. Um, when you're an actor in Los Angeles, one thing that you will learn is that you will go on to a lot of auditions and not get a lot of parts because a lot of people are going. So you have to make ends meet in various ways. And since I was a SAG actor at this point, I was hired to be in her music video as an extra. So I believe this was filmed at Warner Brothers. If not Warner Brothers, it was uh, Universal Studios Florida, or Universal Studios Hollywood, but I'm pretty sure it was Warner Brothers. And um, I actually have a still from the music video of me right there. Basically all I was brought in for was they needed people to look like fans, press, things like that at a movie premiere. Part of this music video for My Wildest Dreams was that she was an actress and that she was kind of like in love with her co-star and her co-star for this was Clint Eastwood's son. So this was kind of a fun music video to make. I remember we got there about 2 p.m. and we ended up filming most of the night because the shots they were using us for were night shots. And so um, I didn't have a ton of interaction with Taylor, uh, but they did film several scenes with us. So we ended up at several locations, but the one that we did um, that was right there um, was was this scene, and all the only interaction I really had with her, and I was a fan of that album. It was a 1989 album, the first time that it came out. Um, I know during one of the breaks, she looked over at the girl next to me and I, and she said something to us about, oh, it's kind of cold tonight. And then she looked around and she said, the boys are lucky because they have sleeves. And I remember just kind of something struck me as being kind of strange about her saying the word boys. Um, it wasn't, she didn't say men or guys, she said boys. So it just kind of, in a way, led me to feel like she was a little bit shy or kind of a sheltered person, not real talkative or outgoing or anything. And, um, but she was very nice. I didn't at any point see her have any kind of attitude on the set. She was very easy to work with. And I think at one point, the, um, the filming, we ended up over at the Biltmore Hotel as well. But the only real part that you can see me in is this photo right here. And that's me right over there in the side. And yeah, it's just kind of a nice memory. It's no real big story. I mean, in the end, I got paid, I think, $220 to be a background actor just to stand near Taylor Swift for a whole night. Now, she was big then, but nowhere near as big as she is now, so it's really cool to see someone so humble and so nice and everything um, do so well for herself. And in that music video, she actually had black hair, which was kind of surprising. So, cool story, small story, but wanted to share it. Our next one is maybe one of the most famous comedians right now, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle had been pretty much missing since his television show ended when he decided to leave the contract and leave. And I was hanging out at the comedy store a lot from, I wanna say about 2012 until 2016, 2017. You never knew who was gonna come in. It could be anybody. It could be anybody from Arsenio Hall to Andrew Dice Clay to Chris Rock. I mean, it really just could be anybody. But being that I'm from Troy, Ohio, a suburb of Dayton, Ohio, I was always hoping to run into Dave Chappelle because Dave Chappelle is from another small town outside of Dayton called Yellow Springs, and he still lives there. 
And when I was growing up, it was kind of known as the hippie town. Like that's where everybody went to smoke pot and everything. <laughs> but um, as I was growing up, they also had like kind of hippie stores, places where you could get unique music you couldn't really find anywhere else for Ohio. So I used to frequent that area when I was in high school to, uh, to buy records and buy t-shirts and stuff like that. You couldn't find rock and roll t-shirts anywhere other than really Yellow Springs. So one night I'm at the comedy store and like he just slides in. Just I just see him walking through the kitchen of the comedy store and I was like, oh man, I know this guy probably doesn't like to be bothered so I'm not gonna bother him. I let him, he's like kind of roaming around getting a drink, doing whatever and he comes walking by and he just like looks up and says, hey, what's up? I said, hey, don't mean to bother you but uh, man, just so cool to see you here because I'm from Troy, Ohio. I grew up there my first 18 years. He looked over and said, oh, oh, okay. Cool. I said, yeah, I, I said I spent, you know, quite a bit of time in Yellow Springs growing up going to Haha ha Pizza and he's like, oh yeah, cool, man. Cool. Not real talkative guy, um, I, especially at that time when he was just first, it's like that really when he was first coming back into comedy, but um, you know, oddly enough, he went up and did a set and then afterward, uh, I was walking through the kitchen with a handful of other comedian friends of mine and he was standing in there and I went over and I said Dave I don't mean to bother you would would you mind if I took a photo with you and he's like yeah that's fine so we take this photo and then I notice in the background I'm getting photo bombed by Tiffany Haddish who at the time you know was an up-and-coming comedian in the LA scene but she hadn't done any movies hadn't done really any TV or anything like that so you only really knew her if you were in the scene and I actually have kind of an interesting Tiffany had a story. I'm not sure if I should ever share it or not, but um, it's nothing bad. It's just uh, it's just something it'd be hard for me to verify, or I mean to yeah to verify. I guess would be the best way. Um, but anyway, yeah, Tiffany Haddish photo bomb our photo. I got to meet Dave Chappelle, who's one of the most famous people in the world, and yeah, it's just like kind of a fun. You never know what'll happen at the comedy store night. That's one of the main reasons I think it was always so fun to go. You never know who will show up, what they'll say, what'll happen. But that night I got to meet the great Dave Chappelle. So our next one is gonna be Jim Parsons from The Big Bang Theory. I wasn't a Big Bang Theory fan, but like I mentioned, the early days of auditioning, not having an agent, um, I had to take background roles. And one of these that I got was for The Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory was kind of a good gig if you were a background actor because they rehearse all day so you basically get like a full day's pay and then they also have to film the show live in front of an audience and you never know how long that'll take so i remember we got there our call time was like 6 30 a.m and we didn't get released until midnight that night so i made pretty good money um got to eat in the commissary which was kind of a cool thing that was also filmed on warner brothers lot and they really were only using me for one scene <laughs> it was a scene where the whole group was kind of in the cafeteria and I was just going to be a passerby in the background. But hey, it was another 200 bucks plus free meals plus, uh, you know, a little bit of being on the set, you know, just learning, kind of seeing. And that's really what I got out of this. Um, I didn't really get to hang out or talk to Jim Parsons at all. The, really the only person on the, the cast that I did was who I talked about in another video, Johnny Galecki, and then when I went to get a drink at Craft Services, I ran into Maya Bialik um, and just said hi to her. But the reason I bring up Jim Parsons is because up until I did Big Bang Theory, I kind of really in my head had wanted to be a television actor. I thought it'd be really cool to be in a sitcom. However, being on the set that day and seeing how hard Jim Parsons worked blew me away. In fact, so much so, I was like, I don't know if I have what it takes to be that guy. Um, you know, he was the star of this show, so he had a lot of lines. And for every single thing that we would rehearse, it seemed like the writers always thought of something better. So every time they would do a rehearsal, they'd say, hey Jim, try these lines now. Hey Jim, now try these lines. He would get four or five different notes and have to do all of them. And then whichever one they liked, they would say, okay, that's when we're gonna film tonight. And then he had to remember that and film it. So he was constantly learning scripts, changing what he had learned, changing his approach based on how they wanted him to do it. And I just thought, wow, this is an immense amount of work. And I would see him, you know, when they were filming our scene before he would go in, he'd be, he wouldn't be in his dressing room. He would actually be like 
in the set of like one of the bedrooms and he would just be standing in there pacing back and forth running his lines and and then looking to see what the next line and i mean this guy was just an absolute professional so i could definitely see why he was so good why the show was so popular but like i said i had always kind of wanted to be in in a show like this and when i saw how hard he worked i was kind of like maybe i want to be a bit character in this because this seems like an awful lot i mean that's a lot of pressure that he has but he seemed to be a very nice guy he was just so the entire time we were filming more than anyone else he would you could just see he was running lines thinking thinking his character just he was a true actor and so meeting him that was a that was a real learning lesson for me seemed like a really nice guy though our next one's gonna be the great quentin tarantino I actually had a job where um, I was a delivery guy years ago for a fitness food service. And I used to have to deliver to Quentin Tarantino's house because one of his house guests who was living in his guest home was Edgar Wright. And Edgar Wright was one of our customers. So a couple of times I had driven up there, I had seen either Quentin come out to see who I was and you know, just in passing really next to nothing. But the first year that I started this vlog, which would have been uh, 2016, I didn't have the money to go home to Ohio for the holidays. And I saw that Quentin Tarantino, you know, I had frequented his theater before he owned it, the Vista, for many years seeing double features. And they announced that they were going to do a Christmas Eve or like a Christmas night feature of his movie, The Hateful Eight. Well, I like that movie. I know a lot of people didn't. I really like that movie. I love Kurt Russell. So I really enjoyed that movie. And so since I was in town, I really didn't have anywhere else to be. Didn't think any of my friends would be here. And it was $10. I bought a ticket in advance. Well, I posted on my social media for anyone that watched my channel. I said, hey, if you would like to meet me, I'm going to be at this. And like two or three people commented and said, hey, I bought a ticket. I'll be there. So when I ended up showing up that night, there's a huge line. I got there like an hour early thinking I would be there in plenty of time, but there was a huge, huge line. And um, as I'm walking to get in line, somebody yells my name and it's somebody who watches this channel and they're talking to me, telling me how much they enjoy my channel and everything. They're like, hey, do you, do you want to get in line with us? And I was like, I don't want to be that guy. The people behind him said, no, it's cool. If it's just you, that's fine. Just go ahead. So I hop in line. We're talking and everything and we're, you know, having fun, everything. And then I just, I kind of am thinking about it and I go, it just isn't right. I really feel like I should, um, I really feel like I should go to the back because I'd hate it if somebody did that. So I ended up going to the back. It wasn't too far back, maybe 30 people. So they end up opening the doors. Everybody goes in. And when I walk into the theater, I see the three people that were friends and they're all sitting, you know, in, in a section, they like wave to me and I go, Hey, you know what? I came alone. That'd be, you know, kind of cool to sit near them. Maybe that'll be a fun experience for them. So as I'm walking up there, I noticed that they have right directly in front of them is an open seat. And then there's another open seat. And then there's like two reserved seats. So nobody has sat in those four seats. Everything else around them is completely taken, but for some reason people were afraid to sit in those two seats next to the reserved. Well, I wanted to sit next to those people, so I ended up sitting there, sit down on my seat, you know, everything, and they start up the movie and everything, like they start doing introductions up front anyway. They'll say, oh, you know, our owner and director of this movie wants to say a little something. Quentin Tarantino comes out and he goes up there and he says, hey everybody, you know, thanks for coming to my theater. I treat this place like it's my home. So no offense, I, I don't do, you know, selfies with people. You'll just have to settle for hanging out with me. And he goes, since in my movie, there is a part where Silent Night is played on the piano. This is a Christmas movie. Don't let anybody tell you this is not a Christmas movie. This is a Christmas movie. So anyway, he goes to sit down. Where does he sit down? He sits down right beside me. So in that vlog that I made very quickly during intermission, I pulled my camera out and just kind of mentioned that I ended up sitting next to him and just turned my camera for a quick second so people could see it and everything just to prove it. I'm here at the movie theater and uh, look who's sitting next to me. How unbelievable. Uh, I, think we're, I think this is going to be 
our Christmas movie for a long time now, the way uh, The Wild Bunch is our Thanksgiving movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a bloody good time will be had by all. All right, so anyway, thanks for coming down and spending your Christmas with us, and let's enjoy the show. Yeah! There it was, man. What a great night. What a great right, night. Thanks, thanks for coming out, guys. Thank you. Nice enough to say hi to everybody, shaking everybody's hands. What was so memorable about this night was that, uh, you know, Hateful Eight is done in two parts. There's an intermission in the middle. And so for the first part is very heavy Kurt Russell, which I mentioned to you that I like. Well, every time Kurt Russell would do something in the movie, I would bust out laughing. And some people have told me that I have somewhat of an infectious laugh. Every time I would start laughing, Quentin, about two seconds later, would laugh at my laugh. Almost every single time. So when we got to intermission, as soon as the lights went up, he grabs my arm and goes, hey, I am loving watching this movie with you, man. He goes, you seem to be the only one that gets it. This is a comedy. <laughs> he goes, this is supposed to be funny. And I go, I, every time I see Kurt Russell, I bust up, I die. And he goes, that's the way I feel. That's why I casted him. He goes, I can't believe people don't get this. He goes, I, I'm, I'm so glad that I'm sitting next to you because God, it's, it's just so good to hear somebody get my movie. And he gets up and, you know, of course people then come up and they want to talk to him during intermission. And everybody has the same thing basically. They're saying like, hey, here's my theory about what's in the, the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. And he'd just say to everybody, that's a really good theory. But it was nothing. He goes, it was never anything. He goes, it was always meant to be something that you wondered what it was. He goes, there is no answer to what was in that. But people would, you know, come up, can I take a photo? No, 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 I'm not taking photos. You know, this is, like I said, this is just no autographs, no photos. This is the way I would treat you at my house. So it was a really fun night. And then when we actually got out of the movie, um, I was talking to the people that sat behind me and they go, dude, this was one of the coolest experiences ever. They go, it was like us being in Tarantino's house with just you and him because he said every time you laughed, he laughed. He goes, it was just, it was so cool to see. So great. He goes, you must have made his night. And I said, well, he kind of said during the intermission, you know, kind of something like that. So Tarantino was really cool in my book. That was just like a great, great moment. And I will, um, I'll put like some little... Uh, blip here to where you can watch that video if you want to see it. I think it's even titled My Night with Quentin Tarantino. But um, yeah, he was he, that was a real honor because I love Quentin Tarantino's movies. All right, our next one is Slash. When I moved to Los Angeles, there were basically two bands that I wanted to meet more than anyone in the world. I wanted to meet Guns N' Roses, the original lineup, and I really, really wanted to meet Weezer. So in the time that I lived there, I did get to meet pretty much all of them. I did get to meet all the members of Weezer I wanted to. Um, over time, I guess I could do a, like a whole video just on meeting Weezer. Um, but the real goal for me was meeting Axel and Slash. I have never met Axel, but my Slash story was kind of cool. I used to sneak into the Cat Club on Sunset Boulevard when I was 18, 19, 20. And um, they always, because Gilby Clark... Tracy Guns and Slim Jim Phantom had a band where they would play, I believe it was every Thursday night. And uh, you just never knew who they would invite of their friends to come and jam. It was a fun night. And I had read years before that Gilby had been doing this gig and one night Axel showed up and got up there and sang. So there was always this hope that Axel would just do that again. And so I used to go every week with my friends who were of age. And um, one night Slash comes in and I think if I'm not mistaken, I want to say my buddy Eric Singer, before he was my buddy, was drumming that night. I think he was the guest drummer. But they brought Slash in, and Slash was pretty hammered already. Um, and then they brought him up to do Red House, because apparently that's one of his, if not his favorite song, one of his favorite songs he loves to play to Red House. I'll never forget, Slash is up there playing to Red House. He's got no hat on, he's got the crazy hair, you know, and he's got a cigarette sticking out between the hair. And he would, he would light a cigarette and then it would like, he was so hammered it would fall out of his mouth onto the floor so he'd have, somebody put another one in his mouth and he'd try and light it or they'd light it or whatever. Well, one particular time, all of a sudden you start seeing strands of his hair go up in flank, like zzz, zzz. his hair was catching on fire. So, 
He ended up playing, I think, two songs, and then it was the end of the night, and you know, I just wanted to meet him so freaking bad. Uh, I always had. He was my first favorite guitar player. Guns N' Roses was really my first favorite band. And um, so he had a woman with him who was just barking at him the whole time. It was before he was married to his wife, Perla. And um, there, I'll go into another story about that, but um, <laughs> it was before her, and I, I, um, I know it wasn't her because um, eventually a friend of mine's car got hit and we went to the police station and they were telling us all the famous people that they had had to bring in and arrest or whatever. And they mentioned Slash one time. They said Slash was super cool, gave them all tickets to the Velvet Revolver concert, backstage passes and everything. And they go, oh yeah, he used to have this girlfriend that was like crazy when just constantly call about nothing or whatever. So it turned out that was the woman. So anyway, after the show, we go out front and um, I thought he would be out back, but it was just so crowded getting back there. I was like, man, we'll never get to meet Slash back there. So we go out front and he's actually sitting out front, like on the ground. He was like kind of so hammered that he's just kind of sitting there and he's lighting another cigarette. <laughs> and so I go and I go, I walked him, I go, Slash, I'm a huge fan. I just, I always wanted to meet you. And he's like, looks up, he goes, oh yeah, right on, man. And he, he gets up. And he goes, here, take this. And he gives me a pen that he was, it was a pen that at the very top had a lighter attached to it. And he, that's what he was lighting his cigarettes with. He gives me his pen, which I had for a long time. It was, it was actually broken. By the time I got home, it was like something was wrong with it and it, it was broken. It wasn't that it was out of fluid or everything. It just, it wouldn't work. Could, like the, the two pieces that you screw together to make it a pen, they, it wouldn't stay together anymore. Um, but he ended up giving me that and then somebody that was there at the club who I saw like every week had their camera and I go, I don't have my camera. Can you please take a photo for me? And he goes, sure. So he takes a photo, never did ever get that photo, never did see that person again. So this was on like a Thursday. Well then Saturday we go to the rainbow and when the rainbow's closing out, I go to find my friends that I, I rode there with and they're talking to this long haired guy and they're like all laughing it up where they like, Hey, Jordan, this is Matt. You got to meet this guy. You're going to love him. I go, oh, yeah. I walk over and they go, Hey, Matt's going to go with us to the after party, ride with him. He's Slash's drummer. And I go, no kidding. He goes, yeah, yeah. And he goes, and they go, he went to MI just like you. I went to Musicians Institute. And so he's like, yeah, I went to MI also. So we start driving to the after hours and this guy's name was Matt Log. And Matt Log is like, you know, we're talking about music. And I think at this time I was, I must have been 18 because I, I met him the first year I was out there. And I told him what I was there to do and everything. I said, man, I just really want to meet Slash. It was so cool. He goes, I'll tell you what, I can make it happen this week. He goes, we're doing a show this week at the Whiskey. And I go, I know it's sold out. I couldn't get tickets. He goes, I got a ticket for you. He goes, but come early because they don't, nobody's really knowing it yet. He goes, but we're going to announce the day before that we're doing a signing at, at Tower Records. And I'll introduce you to Slash, give you a ticket to the show. And then he goes, and then after the show, he's going to tell everybody we're going to the Rainbow, but we're actually going to the Cat Club. And so that's what happened. I went there. He introduced me to Slash at the signing, told Slash I was his buddy and everything. And I got to take a photo with both of them that I'm showing you here. And then I went to the concert, which was great. Went to the Cat Club and eventually, yes, everybody from Slash's band showed up at the Cat Club and I did get to hang out very briefly. I mean, he had so many people around, you really couldn't. And I've heard a lot of, you know, since then bad stories about people, almost nobody has ever told me any good stories about Slash except for Vicki Hamilton. But at least when I met him, even though he was like, this would have been, 2000, 2001, even though he's pretty hammered at the time, he was very friendly to me. I think he saw that like, this is a young fan that plays guitar. This is like a young, somebody like me when I was young. So he was cool to me. Thank you Slash for that. Now we're gonna talk about the great Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. My dad showed me Cheech and Chong movies way before I ever should have seen them. I was watching them probably from when I was five years old. I didn't know what pot was. It really didn't register with me. I just knew that those two guys were funny in the movies and that what was happening, like seeing Sergeant Stadenko turn into an iguana <laughs> as the movie progressed, I just knew stuff was funny. So I had always wanted to meet those two guys. I always thought that would be super cool. And I think it was 2012. 
Joe Rogan had his podcast and it hadn't been around very long, the Joe Rogan Experience, but at the time he was broadcasting, you know, like four or five days a week from the Ice House, the comedy club. They had a separate building room off to the side and that became a podcast studio. So I had really kind of discovered Rogan like just out of the blue because he had Bobcat Goldthwait on. And I, I was a fan of Bobcat, listening to Bobcat tell stories. So I subscribed to Rogan and I thought that was kind of cool. They would always say, yeah, we're here at the Ice House or whatever. So I always was thinking like, that's so cool that it's filmed so close and everything. And they would do it live. So maybe I was a week later and I had nothing going on. And all of a sudden Joe goes live and Tommy Chong is his guest. And I go, you know what? This can be a three hour podcast. I'm going to wait for like an hour. Then I'm going to go over to Pasadena and I'll just hang out and maybe I can meet him when he's done. So that's basically what I did. I went over there and uh, the Ice House had a courtyard, like a pretty big courtyard with benches for people that are waiting for shows to start. So I went out there and just hung out with my phone. <clears throat> and I did know Brian Redband at that time. So Redband came out to smoke a cigarette at the time. And uh, he's like, what are you doing here? I go, I just want to meet Tommy Chong when the show's over. He goes, oh, dude, he's totally cool. He'll, he'll be cool with that. I said, okay, man. I said, I, I don't want to be like, you know, creepy or anything. I said, it just means a lot because my dad passed away when I was young and Cheech and Chong was something that we watched together. And he's like, yeah, no worries, man. So I'm actually watching the show on my phone, watching the podcast happen on my phone. And then Tommy says he's going to go outside and have a cigarette. So he comes out and when he comes out, um, I'm just sitting there. I didn't want to bother him. He's like, Hey, how's it going? And so then I go, well, okay. He initiated it. So I walked over and just told him, I said, Hey, I don't mean to bother you, man. I said, I certainly don't want to mess up the podcast. I was going to wait till after I said, I just, I'm a huge fan. My dad showed me your movies when I was a kid. And I said, I was hoping that, um, I had a cassette or like a VHS that my dad had taped a couple of the movies on and it had my dad's handwriting. And I just said, you know, this is my dad's handwriting and these are the movies that we watched together on his tape. So I was hoping maybe you would sign this tape for me. I want to give it to my sister. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's really cool, man. Yeah, I'd be happy to. He signs it for me. He said, so let me ask you a question. He goes, did you, he goes, at that age, did you know what pot was? And I said, no. I said, I didn't have a clue. But I said, I just... I said, I got the comedy. I got whatever it was. It, it was. it was funny. I said, I got whatever it was making you guys do. It was funny. But I said, no, I didn't know what it was. And I didn't even think to ask my dad what it was. And he goes, that's so cool, man. He goes, that is so cool to hear. Because he goes, I like knowing that, it, that the comedy stands out above what the subject matter was. And he goes, man, that, that really, like, you don't know how much that, like, kind of made my day knowing that somebody your age that was that young got our humor. And I said, Oh, for sure. So he, <clears throat> I had stopped. There was a record store literally right around the corner and that's where I'd parked. So I had popped in, bought a Cheech and Chong record. He also signed that for me, took this photo and all that happened in basically the 10 minutes in which he was smoking his cigarette. So our last one is a man I actually never thought that I would ever get to meet. Nicknamed Captain Hook, the great Sparky Anderson. He was the coach of the Big Red Machine. He was the manager also of the Detroit Tigers of 1984. He was a guy that my grandpa and everybody in my family that loved baseball, they loved this guy. He, you know, he, he was basically the man that brought out the best in our best team. And the Big Red Machine was just something that if you were from Cincinnati or you grew up in Cincinnati, took over the entire city. And uh, I had seen on the, the celebrity mail-in sites that Sparky would sometimes sign autographs. And so at some point in my life, um, I think it was probably 2007, something like that, 2008, I had a baseball that I had gotten at a Cincinnati Reds game where a player had thrown it to me when I was younger. And I sent it and asked Sparky if he would sign that ball for me. And um, I did get it signed. And when it came back, it came back with a note that said, Sparky's health is getting too bad for him to sign autographs. Thank you for 
writing him, but he won't be able to answer any more fan mail. Which I thought was very sad, obviously, and um, I never sent anything again. But then years later, I had season tickets with the Dodgers, and I think this would have been 2009 or 2010, and the Tigers were in town to play the Dodgers. Wasn't something that happened very often. Interleague play was kind of new. And um, so I would always get to the stadium early and kind of roam around. You just never knew who you'd run into. And this particular day, I happened to be, I happened to get off the escalator on the third floor, which like the press level floor. And as I'm walking through there, I see like a hand, yeah, maybe five or six Dodger fans kind of lingering. And um, all of a sudden this door opens, two security guards walk out and Sparky Anderson is right there in between them. And people start, Sparky, can I get an autograph? Sparky, can I get an autograph? Well, he, you know, he was there to probably visit Vin Scully. And um, the security was like, no, 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 please don't bother Mr. Anderson. So as Sparky's walking by, I stick my arm out and I show him my Reds tattoo. And I said, Sparky, my whole family are Reds fans because of you. And he grabs my arm like this, looks at it, squeezes it, pats it like that, and then he grabs my cheek and says, bless you, my boy. God love a Reds fan. <laughs> and I was holding a baseball because I always had a baseball handy, and I saw all the, the Dodger fans with baseballs out, so I was like, oh, somebody's probably gonna come out of here soon. Well, I didn't even ask him for an autograph. He just took the ball out of my hand and took the pen and signed it for me, and then signed a couple autographs for the other people that were there. Um, I didn't get a photo with him, but I got photos of him right there with me. And it was just a cool moment because um, I think I had read later on that he had Alzheimer's. And so, you know, I could tell after I read about that, that's probably what was going on. He didn't look completely lucid when, we, when I met him. But um, it was really cool to just get to say one thing that like changed his whole mood. And when he saw my tattoo, he just brightened up. It was so fun. And um, I was able to give that baseball that he signed. Um, I have one. And then the one that he signed through the mail, uh, he actually made it out to my grandpa because I told him that my grandpa used to take me to games every year. And so he made it out to Papaw. And that baseball sits in a game, in a cube, like a baseball cube in Papaw's house, always on display. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed my meeting celebrity stories. There could definitely be more. I found so many pictures of people that I've met. And even though I'll think that there's not much of a story there, then I'll remember, oh yeah, there kind of is a story there. So hope you guys enjoyed these. Hope you enjoyed the pictures and we will see you next time. Have a great night. Goodbye.